Because there's a passage in uh, Desire of Ages, page 493, that says nothing reaches so reaches so fully down to the deepest motives of conduct as a sense of the pardoning love of Christ. And so, I don't know about you, but that has been the case for me in my life as I have realized the power of pardoning love. It has totally transformed my life and is transforming my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, what I want to share with you today is, as the um, scripture readings indicated, about Mary Magdalene. Mary of Bethany, they're the same person. A lot of people don't believe that, but if you read carefully in the Bible and in, in especially the book Desire of Ages, it's very clear that Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene are one and the same. And I really appreciate her experience. I wasn't involved in the kind of life particularly that she was involved in, but I was a mess. I was, my, my issue was a terrible anger issue. And a lot of that stemmed from my past, and I know that God took that into account in my life, just like he did in Mary's life. And so, we're going to look at today an object lesson, lesson in the effectiveness of the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God and the salvation, right? So we're going to look at that. Jesus would soon die, and he is teaching, he's trying to teach his disciples about his death and what happened in one ear and out the other, right? Okay, we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but the disciples basically were so consumed with their concept of Messiah that they really couldn't hear what Jesus was actually saying to them. But there was one person who did, and that was Mary. And we're going to look at five scenes from her life. Actually, one of the scenes is two different incidences, but we're putting them together because they're so similar. And so we're going to do some comparisons by way of contrast today, and we're going to look very carefully at this lady and see what we can learn from her experience. By the way, if you question that they're the same, Mary Magdalene and Mary Bethany, if, if you read the chapter on the feast at Simon's house, Sister White very clearly brings it out that, yes, they are the same. We read for our scripture reading Matthew 26, 6 through 13, and I have to say, praise the Lord, because he used Brother Brooks to kind of pave the way for this, this presentation today in his uh, Sabbath School Superintendent remarks. They were very much uh, connected, and I appreciate it. So, um, we're going to look at five scenes, and you can see that I have up here some words written out, and I'm going to explain to you why I have those words there and what it has to do with you and me today. And so, when... Mary was interacting with Jesus, where was Jesus in the sanctuary scheme of things? If you look at the sanctuary outline, in the outer court. He was in the outer court, okay? And then when he ascended to heaven, of course, he went to the holy place. And now, where is he? In the most holy place. Now, at each step of the way, you know, he's training these 12 men, these disciples. At each step of the way, Jesus could move forward. He moved from the courtyard into the holy place without the disciples really understanding what he was doing and without them really being in harmony with him. They didn't really get it until after he was resurrected, right? Okay, and went to heaven into the holy place. And then in 1844, when Jesus moved from where? The holy place into the most holy place, did people fully understand? Mm -mm. Were they really with him? Mm -mm. No. No. And so now he's in the most holy place, but there's another step after that, right? What's the next step? His return to the earth, right? And his inauguration as king. But what happens if he moves from the most holy place? So that next step, and his people are not with him. That's it. That's it. Salvation is ended. So he's actually delaying his next step because we're not united with him. And what I want to do is let's look at the life of Mary and find out 
How did she get so united with Christ that she was right there with him? She was really the only one that got it. And even then, she didn't fully get it, but she got it more than anybody else. And it gives me goosebumps as I talk about Mary Magdalene because I just, I learned so much. Every time, even just getting these studies out now and, and reviewing them was such a blessing to me. Okay, scene one, as it says here, is judgment, acquittal, and charge. Okay, we're going to look here. Let's take your Bible and turn to John chapter 8. We're going to look at this probably a little bit more than we do the other scenes. Um, so, because this is, this is kind of our introduction to Mary, quite an introduction. John chapter 8, verses 4 through 11. And I'll, I'll kind of read through it, sort of. Okay. The disciples were not here so far as we know. They may have been observers, you know, they're not mentioned, but I'm sure they were here because they all discussed that. They all are familiar with this story. It's only found, this story is only found in John. But at any rate, the, disciples, the uh, Pharisees are trying to set Jesus up because they want to destroy him. And they're trying to just keep doing these things to try to trip him up. But I really appreciate Jesus always landed on his feet. And I especially appreciate how he landed on his feet with this situation. Because we, in our lives, I'll get to that in just a minute. We're all right where Mary is. And let's talk about that. Okay. And they say to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And Moses in his law commands us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Of course, they were saying that to tempt him, that they might accuse him. In verse 6. In verse 7, Jesus went down to his knees. And what did he do? What did he, he started writing in the sand, right? In verse 7, I really like the way it says this. So when they continued asking him, Jesus practically ignored them. And they started pestering him for an answer. And so, just picture this in your mind. We're getting a lot of thoughts on this thing. So he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Now, I want to pause right there because I want you in your mind to put yourself in Mary's place. Let's think about it. I'm going to read this to you, just a paragraph or so here from Desire of Ages 462. The woman had stood before Jesus cowering with fear. She was totally exposed. Her sin was blazoned abroad before everyone. Nothing was hidden. I wonder, do you think that the Pharisees permitted her time to attire herself modestly? We don't know that. It doesn't say. She was caught in the act. So at best, she may have had time to grab a sheet. And so here she is, just totally humiliated totally exposed. His words, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, first cast a stone, had come to her as a death sentence. So here she is, totally exposed, totally alone. Her accusers are surrounding her like a bunch of wolves. And there's Jesus. Stoop down. He stands up. Whoever is without a sin, let him first cast the stone. And here's Mary. I don't know how she was standing, but I'm sure she was just waiting for the blows to fall. I can imagine her insides were quivering. She was probably trembling from head to toe. She knew that her fate was sealed. And can you imagine the astonishment as one by one, her accusers turned and walked away. And that right there, that scene, is the key to an all-out love for Jesus. What it says that she did next has so touched my heart. Jesus, she dared not lift her eyes to the Savior's face, but silently awaited her doom. In astonishment, 
She saw her accusers depart speechless and confounded. Then those words of hope fell upon her ear. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Can you imagine how she felt? Her heart was melted. We don't have to imagine. We're told right here in Spirit of Prophecy. Her heart was melted and she cast herself at the feet of Jesus, sobbing out her grateful love and bitter tears, confessing her sin. If you have not been in that position yet, you don't know what it is to have an all-out love for Jesus. If you don't know that you are the chief of sinners, you don't know what this experience means. Because, brothers and sisters, we all are right there. That's me, standing, waiting for the stones to hit. I should be dead. But Jesus, neither do I condemn thee. The only one who could did not condemn Mary. And so Mary faced judgment. She faced the exposure of her sins. And what did she do? She stayed. She fell to her knees and wept bitter tears of repentance. But what did the Pharisees do? They left. Their sins, were told, were written in the sand. You know, they announced her sin just publicly. Publicly exposed. But Jesus quietly knelt down and wrote their sins in the sand so that it could be easy. Even a breeze could blow it away. He could just wipe it out with his hand. They could have had what Mary had, but they weren't willing to do what Mary did. They were not willing to acknowledge him as the only one who could not, would, who could condemn, but would not condemn. So Mary faced the judgment, and Mary was acquitted, because she stayed. Do we have a judgment to face? Will we endure? Are you willing to be totally stripped and exposed before God? He says in Revelation 3, we're what? What does it say? Poor, wretched, poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. We're standing right there with Mary. Will we endure that? Or will we be like the Pharisees? Gather our robes and walk away. Mary was acquitted. And then she received a charge. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, we do know that um, Jesus prayed for her and she heard his strong crying and tears. I'll probably read a passage about that a little bit later. And he had to cast out seven demons more. I, I don't know, maybe one of those demons was bitterness because signs of the times... Uh, May 9, 1900, paragraph 15, indicates that the one who led her into that sin was her uncle, Simon the leper. And we'll talk about him a little bit later. So, um, Jesus was willing to deal with the Pharisees the same way that he did with Mary, but they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it. By the way, Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22 both say, that who is to be brought when they're caught in the act? Where was the other one? He was not there because this was a, this was a setup. This was a setup. Okay. Ministry of Healing, page two sixty seven, says: In the consciousness of sins forgiven, there is inexpressible peace, joy, and rest. Do people need peace, joy, and rest today? We sure do. The world is a mess. And I suggest that until we are willing to stand where Mary stood that day, we will never truly know peace, joy, and rest. Okay. Let me just read a couple of passages, a couple of paragraphs from Desire of Ages 568. Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have distinguished 
extinguished every spark of hope in her soul that he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. Maybe one of those demons was resentment against her uncle. We don't know what those seven demons were, but the Lord took care of it. She had heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to his unsullied purity, and in his strength she had overcome. Can you imagine what it was like to her to hear Jesus weeping and praying for her? I mentioned her name in prayer. Can you imagine how powerful is that? Well, we know that often Jesus wept entire nights and prayed with strong crying and prayers and tears. He was praying for us then. He did mention our names. And so when we look at that scene, those scenes of, this is why we're told to, to spend a thoughtful hour studying the, the, the life of Christ. Because when we see him there kneeling in prayer, weeping, sobbing in agony for the strength to carry on, and the right to say, neither do I condemn thee, because he was going to be condemned. That was me. He was praying for me. I don't know about you, but that's pretty powerful. When to human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibility. And in Mary, that sinner woman, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker of the divine nature. All right, scene two. Observation and preparation. Okay, scene one. Mary met the judgment. She received an acquittal. And then she received a charge. Go and sin no more. And according to this, she took the charge to heart. She became a partaker of the divine nature. Okay, scene two. We're contrasting now Mary and her sister Martha. We're going to look at these two love just a few uh, chapters over in John chapter 11. This is the scene where their brother Lazarus had died. Um, they lived in Bethany. Jesus had been in another place. And he got word that Lazarus was very sick and he purposely delayed. The disciples were urging him to go and heal him. Jesus purposely delayed. And then when... Um, when Jesus got there to Bethany, um, it says he was, in verse 18, he was about 15 furlongs off. I have no idea how far that is. How far is a furlong? Does anybody know? I don't know. Anyway, he was a little bit of a distance, and they got message. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Now, we're going to contrast Mary and Martha here, okay? They both, when they heard that Jesus was coming, said the exact same thing. But Mary said nothing else but, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. That's all she said. But Martha, and I, I have a feeling I probably would have been somewhat like Martha. Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother had not died, verse 21 and verse 22, John 11. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it you. She speaks in faith. <clears throat> Jesus said, your brother is going to rise again. But then her faith wavers a little bit. I know that he'll, show, he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She didn't have a present faith. She had a future faith. And I think many of us are like that. Our, our faith is a little bit too far in the future. We need, it, we need a present faith. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And, whoever, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. And after she said that, she went and got Mary and said, Mary, Jesus is here. And Mary rose up immediately, went to Jesus. In verse 32, Mary was come where Jesus was. She saw him, fell down at his feet. Martha stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in discussion with Jesus. 
And she continues later on. But Mary bowed down and she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. And that's all she said. Now, I have some thoughts about that. Part of, part of me thinks that because Mary had experienced that resurrection in her own life, she didn't put the resurrection off in the future. I don't know if she knew what Jesus was going to do. But one thing that I do know is that the spirit of prophecy brings out that she was being very discreet. Because see, here in the judgment and acquittal and charge, scene two is where we are now. Mary is observing Jesus. She's being prepared for the next scene. She's watching very carefully. She's listening. Let me see if I can find quickly this passage that I wanted to share. It's in Desire of Ages, page 533. And this is why Mary didn't say anything else. And this is why Mary restrained her tears. Okay? On hearing the message, Mary rose hastily and with an e eager look on her face left the room. Thinking that she had gone to the grave to weep, the mourners followed her. These mourners were, were some of the Jews. Maybe some of them were even Pharisees. I don't know. Um, when she reached the place where Jesus was waiting, she knelt at his feet and said with quivering lips, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. The cries of the mourners were painful to her. For she longed for a few quiet words alone with Jesus. But she knew of the envy and jealousy cherished in the hearts of some present against Christ. And she restrained from fully expressing her grief. She knew that in scene one, they were trying to trip Jesus up. It was a setup. And she didn't know what they had in mind for him now. So she was very careful. And if you read further on, this is, I thought this was fascinating. Um, that was about Mary. And then just a couple of paragraphs down, it talks about Jesus. But he restrained his righteous indignation. So both Jesus and Mary are restraining their emotions in this scene. And so she's really very carefully observing him. She's very carefully watching to see what he's doing. And thank you. In scene two, what do we learn? She's observing. She's being prepared to fully vindicate Christ because she is getting it. She sees the hatred of the Pharisees. Her faith is growing. Let's finish up with Martha real quick. Um, okay, I'd already turned the page. Jesus is getting ready to raise Lazarus. In verse 39, he says, Take away the stone. And what does Mary say? But Lord, he stinks. So there's that future faith instead of a right now faith. And I think many of us are like Mary, we're so, Martha. We're so busy working for the Lord that we can't believe Him for present miracles of transformation in our own hearts. Because our faith is looking too far down the road. We're like this, arguing with the Lord instead of, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Okay, I don't know about you, but I think that in my life I have tended to be very much like Martha. I'm a very, I'm a workaholic on steroids. And so, I think some of you are like that too. I see, I see giggles. So yes, we need to be more like Mary. And, and you know, we do know we need to have both characteristics. Okay, let's move into scene three. Identification and vindication. We're going to see where things really start to become very intimately connected between Jesus and Mary. And it becomes very evident that there's a union, there's a connection between these two. Okay? Again, we're drawing comparisons by way of contrast. And even though this is the one where um, these are both at feasts, the first feast is we're going to talk about is actually at Mar Martha, Mary, and Lazarus' home. And Martha is serving at the feast. This is taken from Luke chapter 10. We won't turn there. 
um, time is kind of getting away from us. But this is a very important scene. Martha is serving at the feast, and Jesus is teaching. And where is Mary? What's that? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, carefully listening to everything that he's saying. And here's Martha. Jesus, don't you care that she's left me in here to serve all by myself? Tell her to get up and get in here and help me in the kitchen. That would have been me. I'm sorry. I, I cook because I have to, you know. I, ladies, I'm not, I'm not the, the queen of the kitchen like you guys are, but um, at any rate, that was Martha's response. Tell her to get up and get in here and help me. Now, I want to break this down just a little bit. There's a couple of paragraphs that I'm going to share with you. This is from Desire of Ages, page uh, 524. Our Savior appreciated a quiet home and interested listeners. He longed for human tenderness, courtesy, and affection. Now the title of this sermon, if you want to call it a sermon, is Are We Courteous? Are We Courteous? As Christ gave his wonderful lessons, Mary sat at his feet, a reverent, devoted listener. Now, I'm going to stop right there and I want to ask you a question. And I want you to answer me, okay? What is courtesy? If you're traveling, you, you just made a big road trip and you came here, if somebody comes to your home, you can answer this, somebody just came to your home, and they've traveled a long way and they're tired and they haven't eaten yet, in all this, what is the courteous thing to do for your guests? Cheerful. Cheerful and, uh, What's that? Be cheerful and help them to feel at home. Okay, be cheerful, help them to feel at home. What were you going to say? Make offers for their comfort. Like make make for offers something. for their comfort. Are you hungry? Do, do Would you like to rest? You know? That's what we consider courteous, right? That's courtesy. Well, listen to this. Jesus has a different definition of courtesy. Yes, sir. When I was growing up, very few people used shoes to walk with. So one of the first things that my great-grandmother and my mother would do is offer them a pan and wash their feet. That's precious. I appreciate that. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. That's what one of the uh, was it I say uh, one of the old people did. They washed their feet first. When yes, they down. that's precious. I appreciate that. That's that's being very attentive, isn't it? Well, let's see what Jesus and, and Mary and Martha did here. On one occasion, Martha perplexed with the care of preparing the meal, went to Christ, saying, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she come and help me. The Savior and his disciples had just made the toilsome journey on foot from Jericho. Martha was anxious to provide for their comfort. Listen to this next phrase. And in her anxiety, she forgot the courtesy do to her guest. What an amazing statement. What is our definition of courtesy? We just talked about it. Well, Martha served at the table, but Mary was earnestly listening to every word from the lips of Jesus. In his mercy, Jesus had pardoned her sins. He had called forth her beloved brother from the grave. And Mary's heart was filled with gratitude. She had heard Jesus speak of his approaching death, and in her love and sorrow she longed to show him honor. Jesus' ideas of courtesy are carefully listening to what he has to say. Are we courteous to Jesus now? He is about to face, as we talked about a minute ago, a few minutes ago, he's going to move from the most holy place to be an inaugurated king. And when that happens, he is going to lose billions of his children 
in one fell swoop. And those are his children, and he loves every one of them. Are we listening to his heart need right now? Are we so identified with him that we feel like he does about the loss of souls? Mary was listening, and she got it. While the disciples, on the other hand, wanted the place on his right hand and on his left. They wanted the glory. They didn't get it. And yet Jesus patiently bore with these men. I want to be like Jesus. Okay, the next scene is at the feast at Simon's house, which is where Mary washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. Let's contrast Mary and Judas. We're told that the alabaster box of ointment, now I, I'm in kind of into essential oils and some of those things are expensive, but I've not found one yet that cost me a year's wages. But this ointment cost her a year's wages is what we're told. And so here she brings this ointment she breaks it and pours it on Jesus' head. It flows down through his beard, all down on his feet. She just totally anoints him, washes his feet with this exorbitantly expensive ointment, and then dries his feet with her hair. And what did Judas say? No, what? Why did that woman waste that stuff? It could have been sold and given to the poor. Now, we're told that her act her of all-out lavish giving was reflective of the love of Christ and his all-out giving in the gospel. He all-out gave everything. And, and she, she's identifying with that, right? She's identifying. She's because his love is in her heart, she's reciprocating that love in all out lavish expenditure. Nothing was too dear to hold back from him. And how do you think Jesus felt knowing that that what she just did is a reflection of what he was doing for Judas and others? How do you think Jesus felt when he said, What? Are you wasting that? Can you imagine how his heart broke to hear those words? What about Simon? That woman's a sinner. I would not let a woman like that touch me. And how did Jesus deal with Simon? Very tenderly. He told him a parable. Who's going to love me most, Simon? The one who's forgiven most or the one who's forgiven little? I get it, Lord. And he won both of them, Simon and Mary. God help me to be like Jesus. I don't have that wisdom. It comes from above and he's promised to give to all men liberally. And I need that wisdom. Mary and the disciples, you know, the disciples kind of sided with Judas. They were a little bit indignant at the waste. But you know, Mary had been delivered from the guilt of sin, the presence of sin, and the power of sin. And nothing was too expensive to give to Jesus. Because she had been given life, you know, and I think often we don't realize we've been given life too. Let me read you something about what that, that act of devotion did to the heart of Jesus. I like these little windows that we get where we can see what's going on in, in his heart. I like to see the heart of Jesus. And this is one of them. This is from Desire of Ages, page 560. Mary's gift gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. Mary pouring out her love upon the Savior while he was conscious of her devotion was anointing him for the burial. And as he went down in the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed in earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones forever. Also the scent. What? Also the scent 
the fragrance. Yes. Yes. I wish that I could say that I was Mary that gave him some light in the darkness of his great trial. I wish that I could say that I was the one who encouraged my Savior when he struggled. I can't say that back then, but I have today. I have today. And I can do something courteous for him now. I can listen. I can look at him and say, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I encourage you, Lord? How can I cheer you? He has emotions. He's made, we're made in his image. He's like us. And now, as he faces the loss of all these billions of children, Lord, what can I do to lighten that? What soul can I reach for you? The loneliness of Christ, this is from God's Amazing Grace, page 163. The loneliness of Christ, separated from the heavenly courts, living the life of humanity, was never understood or appreciated by the disciples as it should have been. When Jesus was no longer with them, they began to see how they might have shown him attentions that would have brought gladness to his heart. The same want is evident in our world today. But few appreciate what Christ, all that Christ is to them. If they did, the great love of Mary would be expressed. The anointing would be freely bestowed. Nothing would be thought too costly to give for Christ. No self-denial, no self-sacrifice too great to be endured for His sake. So I pray that we can truly realize what Christ is to us. I think that we just have a little dim glimmer truly of what He is to us. Let's move to scene four. The trial. When Jesus was crucified, who stood with Him? Judas betrayed Him. Peter denied Him. The thief acknowledged him. Roman soldier. The Roman soldier acknowledged him. And Mary stayed at the cross till the very end. She's the only one of those who had followed him through these scenes of his life. Well, there were there were three Marys: his mother, Mary, the wife of I believe it was Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. The three Marys. So in the trial of her faith, the experiences of going through the judgment, acquittal, the charge, observing Jesus and being prepared to be identified with Him and to vindicate His act of all-out devotion to us, they vindicated each other, you know. Jesus vindicated Mary and Mary vindicated Him. This is what His love did for me. <laughs> he can do that for us too. And so in the trial, having gone through those steps, she endured the trial of her faith. She was right there at the cross to the very end. And all four gospel writers point that fact out. Only Luke doesn't mention her by name. He mentions the women. And the others tell us who those women were. Scene five. The reward of having gone through all of that. Mary is first at the tomb. Mary is the first one to hear his voice after he's raised from the dead. And she's the first one to preach the resurrection. I got goosebumps. <laughs> I have goosebumps from head to toe right now, just thinking about that. That is just so powerful. The disciples are wallowing in their, their disappointments, in their unbelief, and they won't believe that woman has seen Jesus. The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. 
Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Right to the very end. Even he was dead, she was still following him. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. And it was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. That's quite a reward, I think. I don't know about you. You know, as we said, Jesus is about to change places. He's about to close up his work in the most holy place. And he needs people who have observed him, who have prepared to be united with him, identified with him, who will vindicate him. And unless we go through those steps, just like Mary Magdalene did, we're not going to endure the trial of our faith when we're the scum of the earth and it seems like even God has turned his back on us. So we have to go through these steps. And where does it start? It starts with realizing that the ground is level at Calvary. And there go I. But for the grace of God, the most despicable thing anyone has ever done is me. Because crucifying the Son of God is despicable. And I have done it. And so, you know, he's delayed in his coming. The reality of that, the responsibility of that, and the results of that lie at the door of the church. It lies right here next to me. But I want to read you something that leaves us with a lot of hope as individuals. This is found in Christian Service, page 121. Please commit this to memory. It's only one sentence. When churches are revived, it is because some individual seeks earnestly for the blessing of God. How many individuals are in this room? What is an individual? What does that word mean? It means one person. So if this church right here is not revived, whose fault is it? It's yours. And it's mine. If this church is going to be revived, who can be responsible for that? You can. And I can. When churches are revived, it's because some individual seeks earnestly for the blessing of God. And I want that blessing. I want to experience it like Mary did. And I want to do for Jesus what Mary did. I want to be like Mary because Mary was like Jesus. Okay. Our closing song. Uh, I want to ask a question. Yes, sir. Going from what the lesson you give today. When Christ spoke to Mary after he was resurrected, do you think that he would have said, Mary in the same tone to the other Marys that we did to Mary there? You know, that's a good that's a good point. You know, when when my husband calls me on the phone, when Brother Brooks calls, hey, how's it going, Brother Brooks? But when my husband calls, hi honey. <laughs> it's a little different. Now, I'm not suggesting that there was any kind of a wrong relationship between Mary and Jesus, but there was a closeness that I believe that tone was different. There was, there was a, an intimacy of love that they shared, of pure love, that I think it probably was a different tone. That's a good question, good point. Before we sing, I just, I just want to ask you, do you have an all-out love for Jesus? Do you want that all-out love for Jesus? Nothing is too great to give for you. Let's pray quick before we sing. Heavenly Father, you've seen the hands. Lord, you see into our hearts, and I pray that you would remove every vestige of the characteristics of Judas and 
pharisaical separation and all these things that were characteristics of those who rejected you. I pray that our hearts would be open to you, as was Mary's, and I pray that we would truly become united in heart and in love with you. I pray that for each individual here and for myself. In Jesus' name, amen.